What the Lord Jesus did on that cross was because he loved you. He cares about your eternal soul. He cares about my soul. He's not willing that any man should perish. And then the Bible tells us concerning Christ that the disciples, some meeting secretly, such as Joseph of Arimathea, a secret disciple of Jesus, and Nicodemus who came to the Lord by night and had to do it very quickly, took the body of Jesus and took that body to the tomb of Joseph of Joseph of Arimathea and had the stone rolled on that sepulcher. That sepulcher was like a grave. And that would begin the beginning of Sabbath throughout the time and through the weekend. And Mary Magdalene and others that would come to the tomb, we spoke on this on Friday, how the Lord honored the women while the men were meeting secretly, what about the women? We find them at the foot of the cross. We find them loyally, faithfully following our Lord. And in that very dark hours that the Lord was going to show the entire world that he had risen from the grave, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw the stone rolled away, signifying that something had happened, signifying that his body is no longer there. And she made a beeline to tell Peter and John who ran to the tomb. And then later on, to his praise and to his glory, the Lord Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. She was the first to see the resurrected Lord in his glorified body and called her name out. Mary, as she looked and saw the Lord Jesus, called him Master Rabboni. And that began to unfold that the Lord Jesus was no longer on a cross. He was no longer buried in a tomb, but up from the grave, he rose. And one of those disciples, who we know as Simon Peter, who basically boasted about that he would never fail, that he would never mess up, that he was even willing to give his life, check it out, denied the Lord. We've all messed up, right? The Bible reminds us we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. But the same man, Simon Peter, who at one time said he would never deny the Lord, now denies the Lord. But after the resurrection, however, his heart was changed. The Lord reinstated him, in a sense, into ministry. Here in Acts chapter number 2, we find the unfolding of a man whose heart was unshackled, changed, because he believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We begin in verse number 22 in our scripture. As Simon Peter is preaching to the same crowd that he just formally chickened out and denied about identifying with Jesus. Now he's declaring the truth of the word of God. The Bible says, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him. In the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Lord, we thank you for your word. I pray that you'll use it, Lord, to edify and to encourage, to strengthen us. Give us clarity and understanding. And Lord, we'll thank you 
for all that you do. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Last 12 months, I have uh, come to, along the side of loved ones and families and friends to share in the sorrow of the loss of a loved one, even this week, and have been asked by people to officiate at funerals. I was uh, reminded this week as I was looking out on the cemetery of all the people that have passed on in my little New York area, that one day every one of those graves, through God's power, every one in those bodies is going to be called out of their body. You say, how could that be possible? That sounds like a science fiction movie. Well, the God that made us and breathed life into us, there's nothing too hard for the Lord to do. And because of what the Bible tells us and what we just read, Speaking of the resurrection, the resurrection is part of the more important teachings of Scripture. Jesus said, I am the resurrection in the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. There will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. The resurrection is a very important truth. It is the central theme of the Christian faith. You take away the teachings of the resurrection and we have no Christian belief system. As a matter of fact, Christianity is the only religious system in the world that has a spiritual leader who claims the Bible says he had died and rose again and he's living today. Everybody else has passed off the scene. This morning I'm not going to try to prove to you that Jesus rose again. I believe some of you understand it undoubtedly. You've been saved. You've been forgiven. You've been pardoned. Your life has been impacted by that wonderful, wonderful truth. However, there might be someone here that has yet to receive the Lord as Savior. And I would ask you to consider, in that case, what the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves. Notice, first of all, it proves, Jesus' resurrection proves the truthfulness of the Word of God. What we just read in Acts chapter number 2, verses 23 through 28, come from Psalm 16. You might want to take a note. You see, the believers in that early church didn't have the Bible like we have. The Bible is 66 books comprised of books in the Old Testament and in the New and when Simon Peter is now speaking to the crowd, he is quoting from the Old Testament, and the Old Testament tells us about Jesus. Specifically, he quotes in verse 27 of Acts 2, verse 27, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Now, I don't know if where you stand fully, do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Or you believe that it's a bunch of fairy tales? Part of the challenge that we face is that we don't just have an archaic book. We have a book that is God-breathed. We believe this is the Word of God. The resurrection of Jesus proves the trustworthiness of Scripture. Many preachers have said something like this. You can believe the Bible is more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper. Jesus said this in John chapter 2 verse 19. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. That was a prophecy. That was something he stated. Spoken of scripture that will happen to his body and it happened. Think of the two disciples that were not told their names on the road to Emmaus in Jerusalem, there was a lot of sadness, especially among the followers of Jesus. And if we were there, we would probably be saddened as well. Because when someone dies, the natural response is to weep and to mourn, right? We sorrow with hope as Christians. We know that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord 
And we look forward to that glorious reunion one day with our loved ones. But during Jesus' day and after his death, two disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus. They're downcast. They're saddened. The Lord catches up with them. And he talks with them. And guess what he does? He takes the Old Testament and he rehearses to them about what was about, what took place in his life. In Luke 24, verse 25, Then said Jesus unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scripture, scriptures the things concerning himself. So what does that mean? That means that Jesus took the Old Testament and he began to explain to these that were saddened things from the scripture concerning himself. We said this before. Jesus was talking about Jesus in the Old Testament. We believe that God is manifested in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There are not three gods in the Old Testament. There is only one. So the Lord is making reference to himself in the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, According to the scriptures, what we just read in Acts chapter number two is one of many Old Testament passages that are repeated again in the New Testament to remind us and to encourage us that the scripture is trustworthy and true. In the last year, our hearts have been tested I don't know if you've done what I've done. Check out the news on your internet, on your mobile device, on television. This one crowd is saying one thing about the pandemic. This crowd over here is saying another thing. Then you talk to the politicians and everybody has a different view. And in some cases, some people are not telling us the reality, telling us the truth. It can be confusing. It can be disheartening. But when you come to the word of God, you're going to read something that's truthful because the resurrection of Jesus Christ validates that the scriptures are trustworthy. You can believe the word of God. And so if that's true, then man, I ought to be reading it, right? I ought to be studying it. I ought to be memorizing it. I ought to be hiding it in my heart. And more importantly, I ought to become a doer of the word of God. The holiday season for us presents to us and this year certain unknown events. No man has the promise of another day. If I believe that the scripture is true, then what can I do as a believer? What can I do as a child of God? I can become a doer of the word. I can share the message of hope. I can share with my friends and my family. Have you heard of have you ever heard, and we can't assume in our culture today, have you ever heard the name of Jesus? Just ask that question. And, and some, pe some people might think, well, isn't that a Spanish name? Because there is a name spelled in the English name that spelled Jesus, Jesus. But that's not what we're talking about. But we're talking about one who claimed to be one who would one day lay down his life and take it up again. And, and so I'm here just like the rest of you. I have a Bible. I have access now to the scriptures. And because of the resurrection of Jesus, I'm encouraged to continue to believe in his truth, to search it out, and to be able to live by it. Here's the second thing, that because of the resurrection, what does it prove? It proves the deity of the Son of God. Who do you think Jesus is? You may have been attending church for a long time. Who is Christ anyway? Remember in John chapter 14, 
Philip asked a question, and he asked Jesus, and he said this. Now, Philip, mind you, has spent how long with Jesus? At least three years, right? Uno, dos, tres. And um, three solid years watching, observing Jesus firsthand in this public ministry. But after three years, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and he'll satisfy us. And Jesus said, how long have you been, me, been with me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, you're looking at him. You're looking at someone that's not only a man, but very divine. That's what the word deity represents, divineness. Was Jesus divine? Was he the Son of God, God the Son? Well, we know according to the Bible, there are testimonies. For example, in Mark chapter number 5, the demons affirm the divineness of Christ. It's recorded, and they cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. We live in a spiritual world. For the child of God, we are not exempt, but someone greater than ourselves lives within us through the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. The demons know who Jesus is. They affirm his divineness. Simon Peter, speaking on behalf of the apostles, said to Jesus, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thomas, who denied the Lord and who doubted his existence and his resurrection in a moment in time, said, as Jesus was invited to come and touch his nail print hands and his wound in his side, said, My Lord and my God. Think of the many people, including the Roman soldiers at the crucifixion of Jesus, after the Roman soldiers had stuck a spear in the side as Jesus is hanging on the tree. He says, surely this is the Son of God. But perhaps the greatest argument or the truth that we can take heart is found in Romans chapter number 1. And if you want to turn there, in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, the Lord gives us this truth. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, with power. How? According to the Spirit of holiness. By what means? By the resurrection from the dead. Simply said, the Apostle Paul says he is the Son of God because the Scriptures confirm that he rose from the grave, he's alive, he's risen, and confirms his own divineness, his deity. In the book of Acts chapter 2, we are encouraged that he's not only Lord, but also very Christ. Who do you say that Jesus is yourself? You know, I know his name, he's not only divine, it's by the culture of our day, and, and I've been guilty of this. Have you ever cursed, used the name of Jesus in vain? God this and God that, and Jesus this and Jesus that. You think that's an accident? It's not an accident. The demons of hell hate Jesus. They hate the work of Jesus on the cross. The demons of hell hate the word of God. And, and there seems to be a hatred aimed towards our Savior and His precious name. The Bible says that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the resurrection not only proves the Bible is true, it's trustworthy, we can believe it, we can read it, but the resurrection proves the divineness of Jesus. You know that there's a lot of people in prison today that claim to be Jesus. Now, if you come up to me and tell me, Brother Byron, I'm Jesus, I might refer you to the local doctor, okay? I might say, brother and sister, let's talk about this, okay? 
Because there was only one Jesus. And he came to this earth and he gave his life on the cross for our redemption. And he rose on the third day. Here's number three. Write this down. Jesus' resurrection <clears throat> proves the completeness of the salvation of God. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, the Bible says, Who, referring to Jesus, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. My uh, daughter gave my wife a, a box. It was a box of uh, puzzles. And we haven't opened it yet. But ha how many like to do puzzles? Anybody? <clears throat> sometimes they're fun. Sometimes they can be very, really challenging. In my lifetime, I've helped others, my family. And I, and I hate it when we're, we're working on a puzzle and we get down to the last few pieces and it's missing. Oh, man. Bummer. Did all that work and it's, one piece is missing. You say, why are you saying all that? Well, isn't it wonderful that when you get a puzzle, then you get that final piece you put there. It's complete. It's finished. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ. Guess what? The Bible tells us he was delivered. That is, he gave his life on that cross. He was scourged. He was crucified and shed his blood for our offenses, for me, yours, and all the rest. I've said this before, and I believe it's true. I believe when we were growing up, we were pretty patriotic. You say, what are you talking about? We got in trouble every once in a while, and my dad, especially him working with the environmental department at Laguna Pueblo, told us, boys, don't you play with water. Well, this day it was hot. I mean, I'm talking about beaming down. It felt like it was 120 degrees outside. And as kids, we wanted to make a swimming pool. And we saw those colored television, blue water. And on this day, my friends and I, we digged a hole and we got the water holes out. We dug a nice trench. It was not blue like we saw on television. But we were so happy to get in our swimming trunks and get wet. And we were having so much time. And one of my neighbors skipped said, hey, your dad's coming home. Oh, my. So I remember that green government truck. And boy, you talk about friends departing you in the hour of need. Boy, that one took off. That other guy took off. And there I was. Dad comes home and he says, son, I told you not to play with the water. Water was leaking all down the road. You say, what happened? Well, my dad took me to the woodshed. In other words, he gave me, he applied the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge. He took his belt and he gave me a spanking. And as I was shedding those tears, I was reminded. You know, all those years I, I uh, got uh, corrected by my dad and he did it because he loved me. I never had anybody and didn't have my neighbor across the street. My own brothers, mind you, and my own friends that were a part of the offense say, hey, don't worry about it, Byron. I'll take it for you. I'll become, I'll bear your punishment. Never happened. Never, never took place. Anybody ever have that happen to you? Anybody ever, ever take your spanking? I know I got blamed for other people's wrongdoing in my lifetime. But think about this. When Jesus Christ was crucified and buried, he did it on our behalf. He became sin for us. He dealt with the suffering on our behalf for our offenses. Of all the wicked things I've ever done in my lifetime, Jesus tasted death. He endured the cross. And the Bible says, and was raised again for our justification. The Bible reminds us that you can't work your way to heaven. You can't be good enough. God's complete package of salvation, his work of redemption through his, the death of Jesus and the resurrection, we are declared righteous. Fancy word, justification. Just as though you have never sinned. How many will like that on their record? I am looking to God just as though I have never sinned. Me, God? Yes, you. How could that be? Well, the Bible tells us 
God sent his son and he was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification without the resurrect without the resurrection of Jesus we have no salvation we have only two religions in the world one says do something you got to do this you got to behave yourself one says you got to keep these rules and regulations these creeds and these traditions, these rituals and all that goes with it. And you can get pretty exhausted and confused on this religious do-gooder road. And the other says, it's been done. And it was Jesus who said, it is finished to tell us die. In our culture in Laguna, we would say, Shrohama, Shrohama. It was enough. It was complete. It was sufficient. And the resurrection is God's amen to the work of Calvary's cross. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Lastly, what does the resurrection prove? Well, first of all, it proves the trustworthiness of this book right here. You can believe it. It proves that Jesus was divine, that he was the Son of God. That he was the Holy One of Israel. The demons know who Jesus was. The apostles knew who Jesus was. And perhaps you know who Jesus is. And thirdly, we see that his resurrection is a reminder that we can, we can take heart that I don't have to work my way to heaven. Boy, if it was up to me, I would have messed up a long time ago. You say, what are you talking about? Because Christians can still sin. We can still have bad thoughts. We shouldn't dwell on bad thoughts. But we are not perfect. We are only what? Forgiven. And thank God for that. But here's my last point. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that there is an inevitable judgment coming. In John chapter number 5, if you want to follow along, verse 21, this is what Jesus said. Now, I, I, I want to tell you that I, it's my desire and it's my hope that everyone in the service today, I hope you go to heaven one day. I hope that heaven is your home. But according to Jesus, not everybody is going to go to heaven. You say, why? Because some will die in their sins. In John chapter number 5, this is what Jesus said. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickeneth them, even the Son of, even so the Son quickeneth whom He will. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For the Father hath life in Himself, so hath He given to the, to the Son to have life in Himself. And had given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming. In the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. And shall come forth. And they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. My point in bringing up this passage is that nobody wants to be judged. The Bible reminds us there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Listen to me this morning. If you are a child of God, if you are saved, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, you will never, ever go to hell. Can I get an amen right there? Amen. We pass from death unto life. Our sins are forgiven. Not because we're a good person. Not because we come to this church necessarily, but because there is a relationship between us and God through His Son, Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 17, here's another reminder about the coming judgment. The resurrection proves the inevitability of a judgment up ahead. In Acts 17, beginning in verse 23, it says, For I pass by... And beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship. Him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that, though, that he is Lord of heaven, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. 
neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he give it to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before it, before appointed in the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him, that's in Jesus, we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, we are also his, of his offspring. For as much as then we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and by man's device. And at the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now up to this point, he has said, this is the Apostle Paul, he's preaching in a place called Athens. Athens was filled with idol worship. They had the great goddess Diana of the Ephesians in that area. There were places that people bowed and prayed to statues. Things made with wood and silver and gold. And he's saying, listen, gentlemen, Listen, ladies, listen, boys and girls, I declare the good news. And he goes into a sermon. He goes into a truth. And the latter end of this truth, he talks about Jesus. How one day, because of his resurrection, we're going to face a judgment. And I point out here, Acts 17, because he had appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. The resurrection, therefore, proves the inevitability, the reality that judgment is ahead. As Christians, we can all thank God we're not going to be there. Whew. Uh, I'm off the hook. Uh, I'm not an angel. I know I'm not perfect, but listen, I put my faith in one that was crucified, shed his blood, and was buried, and rose on the third day, and he has victory over death in the grave, and he gives eternal life to whosoever believes in him. So may I ask you, in closing, with that in mind, are you going to be in that judgment? Are you going to face the judgment of Almighty God? The resurrection proves the validity, the assurance of a coming judgment. If Jesus rose from the gra grave, then we have to accept everything that he said, including the upcoming judgment. In closing, you might be thinking, well, Brother Byron, I don't want to face no judgment. And I'm like you. I know I'm not perfect. I know I've sinned against God. What would you tell me? Well, here's the first point. If you have never received Jesus as your Savior, receive him today. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is a day of salvation. His salvation is complete. He will forgive you of your sins. And He will give to you His Holy Spirit. That's why we as Christians can say, the Lord will never leave us. The Lord will never forsake us. And when you die, you will go into His presence. And God will help you live the life. God will equip you with all the resources that are at his disposal. Whatever the need might be, God is enough. So receive him as your savior. For those of us that already have, like the disciples that we read about, honor him with your life. Honor him with your lips. Honor him with your decisions because one day we shall behold him in his glory. One day the resurrected Savior will behold in his holiness and his splendor. And what a day 
that will be. And so with that, we're going to close in a song. What a day that will be. That is when we see Jesus, our Savior. We're going to sing number 63 in our song book. If you're able to follow along, it only has two stanzas. And then we'll close in prayer. Number 63. What a day that will be. What does the resurrection prove? It proves the Bible is true. Proves the Son of God is divine. Proves that salvation has been complete. And proves that there is a coming judgment for us that are saved. No coming judgment. Rather reward lies ahead. Rather joy, peace, and eternal life with our Savior. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the skies, no more tears to them the eye, all is peace forevermore on the happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. day and we thank you that one day we won't have to meet you as a judge but we'll meet you as a loving lord a savior and we do pray the spirit of god will help each of us and i pray for anyone here today who has yet to receive you that even in these moments following they will call upon you from the depths of their soul now we ask that lord you will dismiss us with your blessing and we'll praise you for all you do and all god's people can say and God bless you. Happy Easter.